The topic of race and racing, it gets a lot of attention. To be honest, there's a reason why you don't see a lot of minorities in racing. Economically, it's just not feasible. There's get on the track money and then there's winning money and it's not the same. Sometimes I wonder if they think like, he's like a diversity hire. Oh, they had to get like one black kid out here. So they gave us this kid. Antonio, he gets out there, he learns the environment. And then like once he finds his comfort zone, once he finds his groove or whatever he would call it, he is unstoppable. So I had started karting when I was about 12 years old. At the time, it wasn't really anything competition-wise. Um, it was on my 12th birthday when my dad and I just went out to uh, Dawsonville to Atlanta Motorsports Park. So I take him up to the kart track. Uh, we get on the track. He's slow. He's just like, I'm running circles around him. I'm thinking maybe, maybe this isn't for him. He's just not getting it. I will, I will admit I wasn't the, the fastest um, on the planet, but at the same time, you know, as I got faster, I started to understand racing in a sort of real sense. Whereas, you know, in a video game, I would understand it no problem. But when I started to actually pick up on it in real life, I was like, yeah, this is pretty straightforward. This isn't that hard. So that was in 2013. I left, came back, and he was significantly faster than when I left. Like something had changed. He was interested, he was engaged. Every month I would come down from Ohio, or when I moved to Illinois, I would come back to Georgia where he lived, and we would go to the kart track once a month. And he would race, and sometimes we would show up to the track at 1 p.m. and we wouldn't leave till it closed at 7. He would race that whole time. He never got tired of it. He would just push harder and harder to get faster and faster. And eventually, he did get really fast. I couldn't keep up with him. I couldn't compete with him. I said, maybe it's time to move him up to the next level of racing, which would be open wheel and him having his own cart. And it wasn't until around 2017 when I actually got my first taste of trying out a actual cart that was made to race. It wasn't just for, you know, rentals. I always remember Alistair Edwards. You know, he taught me a lot of things and he taught me how to be smooth, whereas my dad taught me how to be consistent. And so the two just came together and formed this uh, sort of style. I had started my first real race in March of 2017 with Margate since they had hosted a one mate series called the Night Series. And I, didn't, I did decently well at the time. I was still trying to follow the principle of being smooth, but also being consistent. And, you know, my dad and I, we would talk about it. You know, we would always, always try to think of a plan. And I think that was the one thing that made us, you know, bond together was that we focused on the next thing. We always focused on what can we do to uh, make us improve? I, I don't think we would have the bond that we have now. Racing forced us to really evolve as father and son because for it to work, we couldn't always be father and son. There had to be a different kind of respect. I couldn't be the parent at the racetrack telling him what he can and can't do. I actually had to be the one taking direction from him with racing over time, I learned to not see him as my son and just really my teammate and uh, someone that I want to see win as much as possible and someone I want to see reach their potential. I had just came out, you know, I was a top runner all of a sudden. Everybody was like, 
who is this? And then I take off the helmet and it's me. <laughs> and everybody was like, wait, that, it's you? And it's like, yeah, that's me, you know? He just had a win streak. It was crazy from like November, 2019. He went from never having been on the podium to he was on the podium every race. 2020, um, COVID happens. Um, when 2020 rolled around, we had planned a lot of things. We had planned to go back to Gateway. We had planned to race at Dawsonville. We had planned to come out to uh, Cincinnati and also go all the way to Charlotte over to GoPro Motorplex, which is like the sort of house of karting. Like if you're coming here and you're in the top five, you are you there's serious business with you like clearly you have the skill to move forward until the pandemic hit and so that set everything back for us it set everything into disarray because it's like okay everything we can't do everything now so we were just like okay we're gonna run at dawsonville we're gonna run at cincinnati and maybe go to uh st louis and go back to gateway but during that time, I was playing a racing simulator called iRacing, one of the most realistic simulations I could think of. And really the main thing was trying to build up confidence and trying to find ways to improve my style. When the season kicked off in June, uh, already I was getting podiums after podium after podium. And we were in, the title fight and I was like this is <laughs> this is amazing you know this is uh, it's crazy to me you know when I won the title uh, for LO to estate senior I was like I, I did it. I finally did it and at the same time I was already you know my dad and I were already planning as we always do and thinking about what ways to progress in you know what way or where should we go in order to improve. It was, it was strange. He came back even stronger. Like uh, I'd never seen him compete like he did in 2020. Podium finishes every time. And I noticed, I was like, okay, it seems like he's doing well. He's got this, all right, what's the next step? What's the next difficult thing for him? Or, you know, what's the next level that he could go to that would challenge him? Since I don't think this is as much of a challenge anymore. And then that's when we found out about Spec Miata. And we had been talking about Spec Miata for a long time, even a little bit before I had even started racing. But we didn't know anything at that point. But once we did, we were like, we got to do this. We, we have to do this. And so far, it's been going pretty well. So it's a 2003 Mazda Miata. It has a very, very sleek design. It's black, it has you know, gold and a red stripe on the sides. It has a big red number 30 that I really like. And originally it was you know, like any other typical road car, but you know, over time it's been made into a race car. So everything is taken out from regular seats to you know, maybe cup holders, for example. The interior is very basic, but you know, very barren. You know, you see the, you can actually feel the metal of the chassis and everything. Overall, you know, there's a lot of differences, you know, between maybe a normal car and a race car. You know, it also goes down to the engine at least, and you know how it performs. You know, race engine, you, it's really all about performance, and it's never really about you know fuel efficiency or how much mileage you're getting out of the gas tank. So you may get a worse gas mileage, but in return you get a car that is built to perform on race day. There's a lot of varying factors that go into uh, a race car. And for me, you know, at least for Spec Miata, it's all about keeping it as stock as possible because Spec 
really means keeping it relatively stock, no modifications, no turbo, no supercharger. It's really about keeping the car as if it's close to its production uh, counterpart, but you're making it as if it was supposed to be a race car. When Antonio was younger, he's what people would call an easy kid to take care of. He was quiet, he didn't break the rules, he liked his, he liked his toys, he played with cars. When he was three years old, I came into his room one time and he was watching NASCAR. And uh, like he only watched Pixar movies and you know, whatever cartoons, but he was watching NASCAR. I mean, he was just quietly watching it. <laughs> I always remember thinking, he's the first black person I've seen watch NASCAR, but he's three years old. And so just wanting to bond with my son, I started watching it with him. Over time, I picked up that he liked Kevin Harvick's car. So he, he was a fan of the, the M&M's car. And I liked Dale Jr. because he was the son of Dale Earnhardt. And just that father-son dynamic really resonated to me with me. And, you know, he seemed cool. And so we would watch the races and I'd be rooting for Dale Jr. He'd root for Kevin Harvick. And that's when he was little. Um, he knew I was into cars, I was a car enthusiast, and so by default he was like exposed to car culture. Growing up it was like I always looked up to my dad. You know I remember many car rides I would you know, have with him, and I was always just quiet. And I guess it was sort of because I was always watching him, because I always wanted to be like him. And over time, it's like I try to find things that you know we could do together. I remember saying to him, like, you know, maybe when I'm 16, we can, you know, get an S2000 and work on it together. And I remember when that didn't happen, I was like, you know, there's got to be some kind of adventure that we can do together, like an ultimate father-son type deal and be able to look back on it and be like this was one of the greatest things we have ever done when we had started karting unknowingly were we building you know just an adventure that you know we weren't really expecting to take this far we were just like you know we were just going to be karting and probably stay at karting but the fact that you know we had bonded and we had talked about it and learned things as a whole, you know, because I would learn things on my side, he would learn things from his side, and we would just come together with new information and, you know, teach each other these things. And it's what built the chemistry that was uh, sort of the father-son, driver, crew chief, you know, type deal. And, you know, as, you know, as I continued racing through 2020, it was really where, you know, I felt pretty happy because it was like I felt really close with my dad and, you know I still do and I always will and it's like finally we have an adventure that we can both look at and be like this this is this is it if Antonio never got into racing I don't know what would have happened uh, he's found a lot of purpose in racing and there's a lot of great life lessons in racing. He's really learned the value of resiliency. He understands that, you know, where you are has nothing to do with where you end up, right? You're not your situation. If you work hard and just focus, you know, you have control, some control over the outcome. 
a lot of that he's learned from racing. I don't know how I would have been able to convey a lot of the life lessons that he, he now has, you know, without racing. I would believe that racing has changed me. Um, I remember racing with somebody, his name was Buzz Killingsworth. He was somebody that I raced with back in Dawsonville. You know, he said, you know, racing is going to teach you a lot of, uh, a lot of things in terms of life lessons, you know. And I went through those life lessons, you know, of, you know, expecting a lot, but not being able to uh, meet those expectations or just, you know, doing everything right and then everything goes wrong all of a sudden. And, you know, the lessons vary, but it has changed me to become more observant and, you know, overall someone that likes to find improvement in everything. Like I always try to, even just outside of racing, try to find uh, ways to improve myself as, as a person and find, you know, some ways where I'm like, okay, this may not be working or this may not be going this way. Let me find something uh, new that will help me at least. So, yeah, I would say that, you know, racing has, has changed me a lot in over the past say three four five years or so um, and it's been a change for the better if your kids passionate about it you're you're almost hurting them to not support them um, is racing dangerous? Yes. We've seen cards flip over on people. Um, I have seen cars flip over during races. We've seen cars go off the track. And um, just today, the, uh, there's a clip where Antonio almost hits a, hits a car while racing today. So I understand a parent's hesitance, but I think the risk of not allowing your kid to see their potential is greater than any harm that could come from the sport itself. And that really comes from anything. Don't hold a child back that wants to, that's passionate about something for your own fears. That's kind of like, that's parenting selfishly. Like your child really wants something, but you don't want them for it. You want it for them. Or you're scared of what may happen if they do it. Let them find out. I mean, one of the beautiful things about parenting is you have the ability to create an environment where your child can take risks, can do things outside of their comfort zone, and the consequences are few because you can shield them from that. You know, I always understood what the possibilities were with Antonio going out and racing. Uh, I did everything to make sure he was safe, but I, I would never hinder the passion that he has for racing. I would be a terrible parent for doing that. Uh, mom and dad, I couldn't be more thankful, honestly. <laughs> I couldn't be more thankful. Um, mom, I know you've been, you've, you've taken care of me for 18 years of my life and you know, I moved out um, to live with my dad and you know, I know I really haven't mentioned uh, you and my story a lot, but I really couldn't have done this without your guidance and you know, what you have instilled in me. So, you know, mom, I really, really appreciate everything. Uh, and, you know, when you see this, I, I hope that this makes you happy. And uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm on YouTube now. <laughs> I'm on YouTube, so I did it. I did it. That's all I've got. <laughs>
My name is Antonio Abram. I'm from Cartersville, Georgia. I am a real person with a real story with a real ride.